Dear scholars, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear students, dear PhD candidates and whoever else is here and uh, listening to us. It is my great honor and immense privilege to welcome you all to the first plenary lecture of our Congress. I have an easy and at the same time an extremely difficult task to introduce the speaker who actually needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> professor Homi K. Baba is a professor of the humanities in the English department and comparative literature department at Harvard University. He's a world-known literary and cultural critic and influential theorist of post-colonial culture. The author of numerous works exploring post-colonial theory, cultural and political change, power, contemporary art, and cosmopolitanism, including, among many others, the location of culture and nation and narration, which are an essential reference for anyone conducting research on hybrid cultural perspectives. His ideas and terms, such as hybridity, ambivalence, and mimicry, form the basis of post-colonial theory and have been an inspiration for many other disciplines, such as theology, architecture, or art theory. To quote David Haddad, through his work, Baba has become one of the so-called holy trinity of post-colonial theory, alongside Edward W. Said and Gayatri Spivak. He is a corresponding fellow at the British Academy, fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and critic in residence at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. In 1997, he was profiled by Newsweek as one of 100 Americans for the next century. He has been awarded the Humboldt Research Prize and the Padma Bhushan Award, a prestigious award from the Republic of India that recognizes outstanding contribution in literature and education. And actually, I could probably go on um, listing innumerable achievements and honors of uh, Professor, but I have strong suspicion that you are not here to listen to me. <laughs> so, uh, without uh, any further delays, I believe that you would like to hear Professor Homi Baba. Hello, can you hear me better? Well, now before I destroy the, all the arrangements made here, I apologize. I don't know what happened. I did something strange. Thank you. This is what deconstructionist theorists do. They come and deconstruct the entire room so that uh, they spoil everybody else's agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I can't tell you what an honor and indeed a pleasure it is to be here uh, speaking to you today. So many of you have come out on a, uh, for me, a temperate day, but for you a cold day. Uh, coming from the United States, there is such warmth in this uh, city as I've already discovered it. It's a great pleasure to be here and you resist the coldness and the frigidity of the climate uh, better than we're able to do. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm jet lagged, so you should prepare yourselves for my speech, which might last till early in hours of the morning. Uh, I, if having just woken up a few uh, hours ago, but I've tried to edit it. Even since I arrived in the hotel, I've tried to cut, 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 so that uh, um, I will uh, finish in a timely manner and we can have something of a conversation. Um, I've been treated with the greatest of warmth and engagement in preparing the lecture. And it is very generous of you all to invite me but I always come with a price. When I travel and I write, I like to send my talks in advance to the people who invite me just to see whether the song will play well in a different country. And I, it's always an extra 
um, uh, responsibility and takes time, but uh, we've had several Zooms and conversations, and I hope I'm on the right path. I um, also want to thank more formally uh, Robert Maletsky, the Dean and fac of the Faculty of Modern Languages, who I believe is recovering uh, from some illness. We miss him. We wish he was here, and I'm most grateful to him. And then my new old friend, Anna Wojtysch, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Modern Languages, who has really been a conspirator with me. So if this talk su succeeds, thank me. If it fails, take it up with her. And uh, Maria Balkan, who has been in, uh, 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 in com conversation with me for a long time. And finally, <clears throat> by way of an introduction, I want to introduce the first person that my wife and I met when we got off the plane. Pavayu, or as we say, Pavel. <laughs> or as they say, Pavel, I say Pavayu, so you know. Uh, I'm learning fast. Um, and I want to introduce, uh, to thank him, of course, for bringing us in, looking after us with the greatest courtesy and civility. But as I was thinking about how to introduce this lecture, um, I, we were driving here in the car a few minutes ago, and um, he was speaking to my wife, who, who was asking him a hundred linguistic questions about how you pronounce the L, which has a slash in it, and what do you do with the Zs, and how do you deal with the Ws, and there was a news item, and I said, Papa, you just tell me what they're saying this minute on the news. And he said that they're saying another 150,000 troops, Russian troops, have been sent to the Ukraine. And in some ways, that is exactly where my talk starts. Because after saying that, he said, can you believe it? Can you believe it? It's happening in our own time after. And this talk is based on some work I've been doing, which is the finishing um, um, touches to my book uh, to be published, of essays to be published by the University of Chicago. And Pavayush's, Pavayush's comment, can you believe it, is at the heart of what I'm trying to deal with. Why are we often so unprepared for things we know might well happen again? This is not the lazy idea that history repeats itself because history never repeats itself as itself. The whole point about the symptomatic repetition of history is that you don't recognize the way in which it will rep repeat itself until and unless it's late in the day. So I've been working on <clears throat> this notion of the unprepared. I worked on the notion of the unprepared in relation to the pandemic when we had many pandemics, when there were some technologies for it, and yet when something happens dramatically, you feel you're not prepared for something you already know might happen. The same goes for the um, murder by the police of George Floyd. This has happened again and again. And yet sometimes a traumatic moment can itself seem to be, un, to be something that for which we are unprepared, although we know it has happened. Over, over in the last decade, over 70 people have said, I cannot breathe, I can't breathe. Not only black people, black and white, but it's part of the systemic racism of the criminal justice system when it, in, when it is confronted by something which it feels is different. That difference is deeply threatening. So we had it again there. In many of our countries, 
we also have a sense of unpreparedness, although we know, we know what is the playbook of ethno-nationalism. We know what they will do. We know the censorship. We know the way in which minorities will be seen to be the basis of un distrust in a society and unrest in a society. We know it. And yet when it happens, all that we know about the structural and systemic problems, somehow the trauma of its experience is both something for which we are unprepared and something which brings into the discussion something unknown. And so my talk today traverses this area of argument. Thank you so much for being here, for listening. <coughs> It's called the Chimes of Freedom, and you know why, you will find out why in a minute. And I want to start with a writer who has been extraordinarily relevant to me personally over the pandemic, and particularly in the way in which the pandemic and its own form of time and history confronted or was confronted by the death of George Floyd which then became itself a global phenomenon. And within a month after Floyd's killing, oh, but somewhere between 20 and 27 million Americans marched in protest against police brutality, particularly in areas of race, but also in memory of the death of a singular person. So this notion of the singularity Becoming the globality is something I'm very interested in, something singular. And it's not, singularity must not be seen as just one person. Singularity is the specific representation in one life or one event of a kind of set of contradictions which come to their peak at a certain moment. And that, of course, is one of the central ideas of the work of Walter Benjamin. So the person that I invoked a moment ago is James Baldwin. And the particular quotation from him, which has sat on my shoulder as I've been writing this section of the book, reads as follows. My whole effort is to try to bear witness to something which will have to be there when the storm is over to help us get through the next storm. We are rarely prepared for our own times. This opening sentence has the feel of a cliche. It sounds like a truism that carries little truth a pious sentiment undone by its own melancholy or sentimentality. To be unprepared for our own times is a commonplace phrase repeated in various moments of melancholia and mourning in the afterlife of despair and defeat in the vain search for consolation or an unachievable 2020. Somebody disagrees. Phrase comes not from a sense of a faux pas.
ducked inside the doorway, thunder went crashing as majestic bells of bulls struck shadows in the sound, seeming to be the chimes of freedom flashing. Flashing for the warriors whose strength is not to fight, flashing for the refugees on the unarmed road of flight, and for each and every underdog soldier in the night, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. In the city's melted furnace, unexpectedly we watched with faces hidden as the walls were tightening as the echoes of the wedding bells before the blowing rain dissolved into the bells of lightning, tolling for the rebel, tolling for the lake, tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsaked, tolling for the outcast, burning constantly at stake, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Of late, history has frequently caught us short, and we have been unprepared for our present. As I said a moment ago, we were unprepared for COVID, which the historian of science, Lorraine Daston, described in its early days as catapulting us back to the 17th century. We are living, she said, in a moment of ground zero empiricism in which almost everything is up for grabs. We were unprepared for the eight point five seven four six. Now they say it's nine minutes, but I'm still keeping to the eight point five seven because that's the canonical time that everybody knows about. Sets your watch. You set your watches at eight point five seven, which was the original time for George Floyd's uh, torture and killing. We're unprepared for the eight point four minutes that it took for a mounted police officer to kill George Floyd as we saw a global protest emerge against police violence and racial injustice. <clears throat> Criminal injustice has a long institutional racist history, but catapulted by those few passing moments in Minneapolis, the Black Lives Matter movement lent into risk, as they put it themselves, the activists put it, we lent into risk and in the words of Barbara Ransby, one of its prominent academic activist voices, the interstitial, interstitial spaces between organizations navigated the temporal spaces between high and low periods of movement activity. A sudden, almost unprepared solidarity <coughs> was formed and the race struggle around the world found a new beginning. What does it mean to be unprepared for something that has a long history of happening? Recorded pandemics have occurred for several hundred years. Police killings of black American men and women in unavoidable and unjust circumstances are part of a recurrent cycle of systemic racial violence. Cross-border invasions, such as in the Ukraine, are regrettably very much part of our present day geopolitical perils. Think not only of the Ukraine, think of Syria, think of Iraq. These cross-border invasions made in the name of establishing democracy have a very long history. The very same words were used when the French went into the Maghreb, went to Algeria. Here we are, we are here to help people realize their freedom. These are great people who believe in dignity and their leaders have squashed it. This is no excuse for the tyrants in those countries. But we have to be self-reflective uh, self about the languages our leaders use in the name of democracy to march into various countries. And indeed, <clears throat> we all know that sometimes weapons of mass destruction were merely a chimera. They simply did not exist as the causes belly. There are circumstances in which being unprepared for the present may be an inflection point, one that primes you for becoming an effective political and moral agent by first taking you aback, setting you off center, and then giving the you the opportunity to recover and right yourself. 
making yourself more politically or ethically upright in order to stand up against the illegitimate uses of power. Thought of in this way, the panicky moment of unpreparedness might well prepare you to live up to the responsibility of taking action under pressure and making decisions, risky decisions, in relation to risk as they shape the citizens' consciousness of present-day crisis. I believe that the security we seek can only come when we are aware of taking advantage of risk. It is, uh, this is a large statement, I could qualify it, but I think that's very much at the center of James Baldwin's work, where he says, if we don't take the risk of peace, if we don't take the risk of resistance, then history will forever churn around and around and around in its own cycle of uh, injustice. However, let me shade what I've just said by suggesting that increasingly, with rampant disregard for fact, science, history, and human dignity, those who occupy the highest offices in the most powerful countries around the world are also actively unpreparing their citizens and residents to stand up for their democratic rights and actively policing them to stop their ability to organize in the interests of their rights and civic responsibilities. This leads to the worst excesses of ethno-nationalist social polarization within the nation and to the fascistic annexation of peoples beyond the nation's borders, as we observe with Russia's brutal an incursion into Ukraine. As Pavel Yu says, is this really happening in our time? Those flashes of freedom that um, Dylan talked about, flashes for warriors whose strength is not to fight, refugees on the unarmed road of night, these flashes of freedom, flashing for Ukrainian civilian warriors tolling for over 8 million Ukrainian refugees, the number has gone up, these fragile chimes of freedom, darkened by the tolling of roiling thunder, has a long Ukrainian history. In a stirring essay, <clears throat> We're All Ukrainians Now, the Polish writer Adam Mishnik recalls Ukraine's stubborn, heroic struggle of victims of Russification and deprivation, discrimination and repression, I'm quoting him, victims of Stalinist terror and Nazi occupation. And then, referring to Putin's neo-fascist invasion, he questions the history of the present. And I quote, the full consequences of this are beyond the scope of our imagination. Are we witnessing the beginning of a worldwide war? And then he answers his own question. In every generation, the Ukrainians have always repeated that, and I quote Mishnik, Ukraine is not yet lost. This statement of perseverance and purpose is clear in its political intent, but it's emotional imaginative, affective, and aspirational aura is complex. Clarity lies in the courage of the collective Ukrainian will to survive, to resist, to protect its freedom. But the complexity lies in the melancholic memories of generations of Ukrainians who have lived at the limits of liberty with their sense of the present day the temporality of presentness of history, history present, stalking amongst us. History is not in the past or in the future, it's walking with us where we are as witnesses, in, uh, as we become its witnesses, as uh, Baldwin said. This contemporary moment shrouded by a repeated anxiety of a precarious loss of freedom in the future. So this idea Ukraine is not yet lost. The not yet is actually very interesting because the not yet prevents patriotism, 
from becoming xenophobia. To live in this struggle for survival, difficult though it is, creates a sense of aspiration despite the risk. <clears throat> not yet lost, not yet, not yet, but when? In the near or distant future, this tentative temporality of transition keeps Ukrainian freedom on tenterhooks at the edge of its nerves. It is as if the present day is suspended in anticipation of abjection and abeyance, waiting for the barbarians. Will futurity bring back the lost freedoms of the past into the present, like a memory of trauma repeated and revised? Will the lost freedoms of the past be anticipated in a future that turns into an untimely historical present? It is my feeling that to keep that sense of precarity, that sense of precariousness, can actually make the freedom of the state, make the idea of freedom, a, it, to be aware of that makes it a much more democratic idea than the ideas that assume that freedom will be protected in the way in which the leaders define it by the army, by the police, uh, and it will always be, we, be there because then we are never aware of its fragility. Don't forget, for instance, that in Biden's speeches, both at his, uh, uh, at his inauguration and later, repeatedly calls, not for the failures of democracy, but the fragility of democracy. I've actually written about this idea that keeping the idea of fragility makes us more anxious as agents of some kind of uh, common good and some kind of equity in, within society. To understand what it means to live in the present within the dynamics of a shrouded and fragile freedom, we have to ask the Foucauldian question, what is our present? Our purpose is best served in Foucault's view, not by a Kantian analytics of truth, the conditions in which true knowledge is possible, but by that which might be called, what he said, uh, names an ontology of the present, an ontology of ourselves. What does it mean to comprehend a historical event from the perspective of the ontology of the present? How do we write our contemporary histories by exploring the ontology of ourselves? This is a large and unwieldy question, but it cannot be avoided, however tentatively, in a lecture delivered in wartime in Warsaw. Thunder went crashing as majestic bells of bolt struck shadows in the sounds, seeming to be the chimes of freedom flashing. The ontology of the present must not be understood as presentism, as it is often known today, an exclusive focus on the truth conditions or the so social circumstances of the present day at the cost of historical recall and report or moral speculations on future dilemmas. Indeed, the very phrase, Ukrainian freedom is not yet lost, is not an articulation of failure. It is cast in a future conditional tense that ironically expresses both strong, persistent senses of survival as well as dire prognostication. This political vision of the not yet builds its sense of the survival of present day history by projecting a national future, which is nonetheless constructed on the basis and the lessons of past national freedoms. It is as if the people's courage and determination, their positive politics of freedom is sharpened and strengthened into a stubborn solidarity through the negative politics of loss. So there is a, a, a way of thinking, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment, where negative politics, the politics afflicted by anxiety, the politics afflicted by self-reflection, rather than the normative positive politics, actually allows us to create a more humane world. <coughs> The ontology of the Ukrainian present lives on in a state of traumatic anticipation. As Mishkin writes, in every generation, 
the Ukrainians have always repeated that Ukraine is not lost. From this Ukrainian speech act <clears throat> of hope and solidarity, strengthened by anxiety and the ambivalence of vigilance of loss and failure, we learn a critical lesson on the importance of negative politics, particularly in aspirational discourses of rights, representation, um, flourishing. <clears throat> It's a lesson that the philosopher, Avishai Margalit, teaches better than anyone else. Margalit writes, it is injustice, not justice, which brings us into normative politics. Despotism, not freedom. Moral political theory should start with negative politics. The politics that informs us on how to tackle evil before it tells us how to pursue the good. Thus, negative moral politics should be able to provide us with the moral vocabulary adequate for coping in complex contemporary moments. So it's not simply an inversion or a turning around. It's to think about what we learn from not yet lostness, which allows us to establish, as I said, a more humane and equitable um, uh, structure. With the erosion of the moral values of normative politics across the world, I believe that our ethical vocabulary must be informed or reformed by an awareness of negative politics. The long history of the chimes of freedom are not yet lost, but generations of Ukrainians, Indians, Turks, Russians, Palestinians, amongst others, have lived in the earshot of the tolling for the luckless, the abandoned, and forsake. Today, the devil's anthem of lost freedom is heard on a global scale. Freedom for Muslims in India, almost lost. For Palestinians in Israel, almost lost yet again. For Uyghurs in China, totally lost. For Kurds in Turkey, totally lost. For women and gays in Afghanistan, totally lost and on and on. Through the city's melted furnace, unexpectedly we watched with faces hidden as the walls were tightening. In the debris of democracy's projects and promises, the sign of freedom still stirs in the dust. Freedom has long been celebrated as a universal value, a foundational modern right, and an essential way of life. To adopt Walter Benjamin's formulation on the concept of history, one could say, when freedom telescopes past losses of freedom through the present, it brings the present into a critical state. So it's not simply that the past comes back into the future or into the present, but the telescoping, the pulling together, this, this force, this, this force by which the past it re-enters re the present as if it were there, pushes our sense of the critical state in which we exist. And I say this, of course, living in America is, at the moment, a very critical problem. It's a very critical, the state itself is very critical. Although we do see some signs of hope, some we hear the chimes of freedom more clearly than we did before, but when uh, over 150 people in a major political party on the basis of no evidence against the verdict of all jud legal judgments say that a, say over a period of three years that an election was a fake election, then you realize how in this, highly populous and powerful nation, we're on the verge of living, not with a sense of our own participation in a precarious world, but in a world of denial, in a world of projection. <clears throat> the critical state of freedom is twofold. Freedom as a moral and political principle is the arbiter of rights, equality, justice, capability, and well-being. As an ideal virtue in many convergent countries and cultures, freedom has gained a universal symbolic presence, almost as if 
It is a word that is set in stone. As long as you can say that word, you're free. The second aspect of freedom's critical state it's a, is its ability to push the moment to a crisis and reveal the systems in which we live and in which we use quite easily, quite fluently, this notion of the democracy that we share, which is indeed so precarious. I'm reminded here as I speak to you of Theodore Adorno's um, uh, phrase where he says, I'm more worried by the fascistic underpinnings of democracy than I am by fascism itself. At least fascism, you see it, difficult though it is, but underlining the inside glove of democratic ethno-nationalist power today speaks to and uses the institutions of democracy to actually bring out um, um, results which are entirely oppositional. So this is what I mean when I say we have to be reflective of the critical state that we are in. <clears throat> Freedom as a principle, Hannah Arendt argues, lies in action. In the performing act itself and in distinction from its goal, the principle of an action can be repeated time and time again. I think this has uh, not been um, 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 spoken often enough in, uh, in, 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 in reflections on Arendt's notion of freedom, where she says that the idea of freedom can be contemplated in stillness. You can, as a political philosopher, sit in your chair and write about freedom. As a politician behind a secure podium, you can talk about freedom. But the principle of freedom, she says, can only be activated in action as movement. Arendt's insistence on freedom is manifested in public performative action itself, provides an insight into the raison d'etre of movement politics, which we see around us today, whose civic action lies in organizing public demonstrations of resistance to unfreedom marches, assemblies, protests, and strikes. I think this is a very important. We often see this merely as an outgrowth, as a representation of frustration, angry people marching the streets. I think we do them a dis injustice. Of course there will be breaches of the peace. Of course there will be excesses. But what they, the principle at great risk to themselves, to use the Black Lives Matter phrase, leaning into risk, what they're saying is that freedom is not only in the Constitution. Freedom is in the very act of my being able to move and to ask others to move with me. Now, here we might want to think about this notion of digital movement and physical movement. I've not gone there for the moment, but it is <laughs> part of my thinking uh, for the future. But I think this principle that freedom has to be demonstrated. You have to be able to move. Philosoph philosophizing about it is not enough. Preachifying about it is not enough. Indeed, when we associate the struggle for freedom with the action of political movements, we are indeed actualizing the ontology of the present moment of freedom. It's the ontology of freedom. It's being, it's very beingness in time um, it, it, that we are thinking of as a critical intervention into the present moment of political crisis. Freedom cannot sit still. You may not like the way it moves. At times it may move injudiciously, too hastily, but it cannot sit still. The human trouble arises when the freedom to seize the moment, not the moment before or the moment after, not the promise nor the memory, but the moment to act in time hits a barrier. When the temporal concurrence of holding a principle and acting on it is denied, then freedom's performance is arrested and freedom is disappeared. 
and I'm using the phrase as was mentioned in the in, in, in was the result of the tyrants in Argentina, generals where people were disappeared. I'm using it in that sense. As in the fate disappeared, as in the fate of dissidents, minorities, and freedom fighters who live in tyrannical regions. Politics, as we say, is all about timing. Men and women are free as distinguished from possessing the gift of freedom, rent rights, as long as they act neither before or after, but to be free and to act are the same things. The decolonizing movements of our times, be it Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, or the Arab Spring, Me Too the Me Too movement too, have all sought new beginnings in the sense in which Arendt associates the action of beginning and acting with the principle of freedom. Let me just say here that I do think that what democratic parties in our time, the, the, when they're most of these democratic parties are underlined, as I've been saying, by authoritarian practices, the uses of democratic machinery for the machination of undemocratic power in general. I, but I think that what we have, the, the, the thing we don't ask ourselves, or ask ourselves in a way, uh, ironically, is yes, these are all movements. We agree with them, but somehow they die out. You know, somebody was saying to me the other day, where is Black Lives Matter now? I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but I think that we have been so trained to think about political outcomes, always measured by voting and, 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 and by elections, that we have forgotten what Arendt reminds us of, that the process of movements, the process of performance of movements is as important as the outcome. And I think that's where I want to talk, that's why I want to talk about the ontology of this kind of awareness of the, of the, of the fragility of freedom. The decolonizing movements of our time, Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, or the Arab Spring, have all sought new beginnings in the sense in which Arendt associates the action of beginning with the principle of freedom. The significance of the work of Franz Fanon for the times we which in which we live, majoritarian, ethno-nationalist, and populist of the very first importance. Very few declarations of a new freedom have inspired our contemporaries as consistently as Fanon's aspirational ending to his great work, The Wretched of the Earth. He says, the third world must start over a new history of men and women, which takes account of not only the occasional prodigious theses maintained by Europe about freedom, about crimes, about uh, equity, the most heinous of which have been committed at the very heart of man. But then, as he utters his last words on the matter, Fanon stands on the threshold of a kind of revisionary inclusion of hospitality, not without anxiety, and calls for a new humanism that transcends the sum of its parts. In that act, Fanon attempts to produce in the language itself, not only in the constitutions of the new world, of the new third world nations, but the very principle of movement across borders, across cities, the movements of people of all levels of societies. In this way, Fanon saw the third world not as a nationalist movement, but as a regional movement, underpinned by the fact, as he said, unless we understand internationalism, not internationalism in the cliché sense, but the way in which national and regional groups intersect with each other, we will never be able to achieve our own freedom as a territorial state. He says, <clears throat> a bourgeois leadership of the underdeveloped countries confines the national consciousness to a sterile formalism. It is then that flags and government buildings cease to be the symbols of the nation. I have braided three voices together 
Baldwin's voice with Fanon and Arendt. The Wretched of the Earth and by Fanon and The Fire Next Time, which you all know by Baldwin, were published only two years apart and The Origins of Totalitarianism a couple of years earlier, all in the late 50s and early 60s. My focus today will be on America, but my more general argument derives in part from Foucault's great essay, Society Must Be Defended. You know, these were the essays that he wrote on security, and, after, and then he gave them up. He, he somehow, um, like all uh, geniuses, threw to us the morsels of his unfinished works so that we could then somehow uh, inexpertly and without his brilliance, take them up. You find this also in Walter Benjamin, where some of his most important concepts are suggestively, uh, uh, suggestively presented. You find it in Freud, too, uh, where, the, where you don't have the metapsychological papers of, ma of some of the major concepts, like disavowal. And so instead of saying, oh my God, you know, why didn't he complete his work, I say, at least he gave me some little opportunity to do my own modest work by trying to work in these, uh, with these incompletions. And I just want to say here that in Society Must Be Defended, what Foucault he talks about the fragility of the modern democratic state. And through a whole range of arguments in which he's not very clear, he comes out by saying well, you know, why is there in the modern democratic state such a hidden but persistent sense of the right to kill? And he says there that I think modern, modern Western states have the right to kill, believe in the right to kill, well, and kill is not merely to, to extinguish a life. Killing is also not to have jobs. Killing is also to put people in prison. Uh, think of Iran uh, as we speak. He says, I think that happens because there is a process by which their own histories of empire become the histories of modern democracy. Do you see, again, the way in which the ontology of the present comes from this return, and I'm actually working on that in my, um, in my new book. Um, my... So, so in order to do this, I'm making a distinction in my work between systemic racism and what I call traumatic racism. We all know that studies we have, often data sets, often based on statistics and algorithms, create a corpus or an archive of what is called systemic racism. Over long periods of time, we see what it is, and that is a very useful project, and that actually uh, feeds into policy discourse. People can begin then with graphs and with various kinds of data analysis, analysis statistics, begin to see how systemic over time uh, racism has been in particular institutions. You can think about... Uh, the, the, the black race question, the African-American race question in terms of the United States. You can also think of a similar archive of systemic uh, racial uh, undermining of casteless people or Dalits in India. So most systems have this way of counting, you know, what is disproportionate in that, it, in that society. But I'm as interested now in the current moment given Arendt's idea that freedom is not simply a concept. Freedom is what happens to you when you step out into the street. Freedom is what happens to a child uh, who might be of uh, African-American origin, who might be Kurdish, who crosses a line to get a bottle of milk and is suddenly seen as a terrorist and shot down. Freedom is actually constituted in the possibility of the agency of movement. And with that in mind, I'm very interested in the fact that in the current uh, post-George Floyd writing, 
people have often numerated, quantified the disproportionate nature of African American peoples who are neglected during the pandemic, and of course also people of color, those in the pandemic, the Latinas in particular, not only the Latinos, but the Latina women were a very high proportion who were afflicted by morbidity and, and, and mortality. So uh, the, the systemic is extraordinarily, is extraordinarily important, but my interest has been in tracking the narratives, the mini narratives of how these racial assaults take place. And it is quite striking that people use anecdotes or they use um, 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 uh, diary entries. But it is quite striking to me that it is not only the death of bl black people or, peop or minorities in other countries or people of color that is important. It is what they were doing, what they were doing, what the quality of their own actions were, what were their movements in the Arendtian mode, what freedom were they claiming from that movement when, due to some suspicion, some uh, alleged uh, stereotypical idea, they were actually stopped, searched, and often killed. So to me, that whole idea of the trauma of everyday life, the risk of being, of living as a person of color, as a Latino, as a, as a Palestinian, as a, as a, uh, an, 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 a, a, a Dalit, to me that moment of time is what I call the traumatic rather than the systemic. And it is a different, y the traumatic can then be quantified in the systemic registers and archives. But phenomenologically, for cultural theorists, for writers of literature, for artists, that moment when somebody steps out to do go and visit their grandmother, but might take a detour to a neighborhood which is, which is racially much more homogenous and is therefore picked up by the police as doing something suspicious, those allegations, those scenarios of traumatic uh, moments are absolutely important to me. And this is an idea <coughs> that the great African-American poet, novelist, philosopher, and politician, W.E.B. Du Bois, brought to our mind. And it is an area of Du Bois's work that has not been developed. I'm trying to do that myself because people are much more interested in the larger national narratives or the larger systemic narratives he talks about. And he puts it like this. He says, my pale friend asks me, are you really always traumatized by racism? <laughs> you studied Hegel with William James at Harvard. You then went to the Humboldt University in Germany you know the best music. You yourself are, your doors are open for you. So what are you saying? Are you really, do the Jim Crow laws, Southern Jim Crow laws of segregation really affect your life that deeply? Are you always and everywhere scared of the racial color line? And Du Bois says something which to me is extraordinarily prescient and important for my notion of traumatic racism. He says, not everywhere, but anywhere. Not today in Boston, but tomorrow in Atlanta. Not day before yesterday in Georgia, but day after tomorrow in, um, in, in New York. And he goes on to say, and I'm not quoting, I'm just quoting from memory, every, those are the awful dying moments when you don't know, when you are, in what I've been saying, unprepared for something you know will happen. And being unprepared for something you know will happen is a very complex psychoanalytic condition, very complex political condition, it doesn't fit into the measures and the quantitative measures 
of, uh, of systemic racism. It is difficult to take those concepts of anxiety, ambivalence, fear, as Du Bois put it, yes, I am fearful of not knowing what might happen to me. And those things not happening to me continually make me live in the shadow of the fear as to when they will happen. These problems that I associate with traumatic racism cannot be studied, in my view, through the structural, functional, um, outcome-related discourses of systemic racism or systemic inequality. And I think, as I end, I just want to say that traumatic racism really is what we begin to see in two areas. One, in the work of poets, black poets in this instance, poets, but also untouchable poets, Dalit poets in India, these threaten communities who know both sides of what is supposed to be the democratic promise, which is the democratic fragility, and you live in between them. The traumatic comes from not knowing, from being unprepared for that which you know may happen to you. Poets and also certain important dissenting opinions uh, in the US Supreme Court. And in my book, I analyze both. Justice Sotomayor, for instance, um, uh, in a dissenting opinion, says, think of, a, a think of the notion of stop and frisk. Just think of what happens to an individual. Says, don't just think of the breaches of the law, whether the policeman was actually doing what the policeman, the traffic policeman was working within the rule books or not. A person of color is asked to step out of the car in a busy road. Repeatedly, that person has a particular epidermal ontology. They're black. Then they're asked to put their hands on the, uh, on the car. Then they are body searched, as she says. Intimate parts of the body in public are actually searched. Then there is a whole surveillance operation where they're asked to sit there while people wondering what's happening. Who is this? Oh, God, this is another black person. This is another person of color. Then you get their whole profile. Then either the person who is being profiled, racial profile, you know what that term means, is so panicked that they do something. They ir they're erratic. They want to get away. And then they're supposed to be in violence of the law and are shot or are handcuffed and thrown in to the jail. And incarceration rates, as you know, of people of color in the United States are punishing. Now, if you read the actual eight or nine minutes or 8.57, nine minutes of the, of the um, uh, George Floyd um, uh, 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 arrest, this is absolutely true. He's pulled out for a counterfeit note, let's say the note is counterfeit, we don't know, it's an alleged counterfeit note. And then he's pulled out, and then after being pulled out, he is, he says very early in the, in the whole encounter with the police, I am claustrophobic and I suffer from anxiety syndrome. And the people who are with him say, they say, well, why, why, why? He said, because the last time I was shot, was exactly in these circumstances. And then they say, no, you're just wriggling around. You're resisting arrest. So then they go heavy on him. And eventually he says as many times, I can't remember, 16 or 17 times, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And the response is, you are saying you can't breathe, which shows that you have plenty of air in your lungs. And we know how that ended. So I'm trying to suggest that we need more attention, not only in the arts. The arts always look at these moments. But the morality of these moments, the ethics of these moments, the legality or I of these moments really need to be deeply um, uh, examined. And that is what Sotomayor has argued for again and again, that it's the, 
de-dignifying of the individual, the way that body is placed in public, it's touched, it's searched, stereotypes and profiles develop. It's on the lo local news, even if it doesn't hit the national news. And suddenly, we have this notion of, uh, of these uh, rampant people of color running around as enemies of the state. This form of traumatic racism, as Du Bois put it, not every day, but, un, but sometimes, not always, not here but there, is what I call the politics of the unpreparedness. And I think that is a very central idea at the moment to think about, particularly a at a time when major political parties are seen to be in a decline, at least in the countries I know, and the only chimes of freedom are often these movements that come and go. So we are in this complex situation. It's not only a historical moment, it is, but it is also about the time of our lives. We live these two temporalities, the temporality of traumatic repetition and iteration, as I've been illustrating, and then the need to have a longer durée, a longer temporality of hope, an architecture of autonomy and freedom. And this is the, at the heart of my new book. I don't think anyone has articulated this mo moment of the traumatic better than Du Bois, better than Arendt, better than uh, uh, Baldwin, and today better than the African-American poet Claudia Rankine. And at a time today, what is worth remembering is that because of this new technology of the video, I have a section here called Teletrauma and Technology, which is far too long for this evening. Suddenly, Donella Fraser, in her iPhone, had the life of another man in her palm, in proximity to her. It is worth remembering that the millions who took to the streets in Floyd's memory, protesting police brutality, were summoned to action by the teletrauma, the communication, the teletrauma across the world of an image the size of an iPhone screen. Now, in the palm of my hand, I hold the death of another in proximity to my own life, now in the memory of a life that once passed in 8.46 minutes, 8.56 minutes, my pulses race as if the past is literally the fate of my present and future. The risk to black lives, the risk to minority lives, the fact of death in life is unprepared for the risk to, the li to minority living, the act of life as death. Cordia Rankine, the great poet, anticipates my argument as I end it. She writes with a litany of black and colored deaths in memory of Philando Castile, in memory of Jordan Edwards, in memory of Stephen Clark, in memory of Brianna Taylor, in memory of George Floyd, in memory, in memory, in memory, because white men cannot police their imagination. Black people are dying. Living as we do, between the politics of parties and the politics of movements, between systemic injustice and traumatic injustice, between a long durée of history and the short temporal moment of trauma, we have, as I end, to think of freedom's possible futures as they fly past in present time. We only half understand them, 
and we can never fully see the end or the outcome of the experience. We ask ourselves in a rhetoric of unpreparedness, how long will this protest last? How far will that movement go? These are absolutely the right questions to ask so long as we don't believe that there is a right answer to them. In asking these questions, we prepare ourselves for a political temporality of speech and action for which we may as yet be unprepared, but which enables us to act beyond the last long-lasting policies of evolutionary reform that are all too often afflicted with short memories and broken promises. Healthcare reform, police reform, criminal justice reform. The intimation of the future's president, of present is often an untimely moment. It disturbs our sense of historical duration and political direction. It bewilders us and makes us feel belated in our own history. At the same time, it is from within such disruption and disorientation that we move closer to Fanon's call for freedom and resistance when he says, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it in relative opacity. True, as Fanon's words are, opacity isn't all. In discovering their own mission, however tentative and turbulent, in trying to mark the time of risk, however short it may be and however traumatic, women and men are summoned by the chimes of freedom as well as the tolling of the dark storm to find a new beginning, to say in dire circumstances, Ukraine is not yet lost, and to acknowledge in awe and anxiety that to be human and to be free is one and the same thing. To quote from Arendt, God created man and woman in order to introduce into the world the faculty, the movement of beginning, of freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for your appreciation. I'm very grateful to you for staying up so late. I'm also grateful that I could edit my talk down to half its length <laughs> while reading it to you. Otherwise, you'd have not clapped so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Baba. Uh, for this, I'm, I'm really lacking words, so <laughs> please help me. <laughs> uh, inspirational, very deep, and very moving talk. Uh, I, I had this pleasure of sitting in front of the audience so I could see the, the faces of people and uh, I could hear this absolute silence, uh, apart from the, the, the microphone <laughs> playing some tricks uh, at the beginning. So I believe that this actually shows that we were all completely transfixed uh, by, by, by this speech. Um, Professor Baba kindly, uh, kindly agreed to answer some questions, if we have uh, questions uh, from the public, um, then please, we have some spare mics. Um. Yes, we do have questions, so uh, 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 yes, please. Uh, yeah, but, but for, for, for this, yeah, but for just for the sake of, uh, w w yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for, for your words. I found that um, very enlightening. And I was particularly interested in this idea that you quoted from Arendt, which I was not familiar with, about um, freedom being not just the idea, not just theory, but also praxis, the, uh, the, uh, the ability to move. And this made me wonder, I'm a gender studies theorist, and I think sometimes one of the things that we struggle with with women's agency is not, is when women do things is should they have done that? Um, I think you mentioned Me Too, should they have gone to this place knowing that it was potentially dangerous? I think it's relevant to your argument as well of should, should ha Trayvon um, White have been out at night um, and so I, I would just I would appreciate any clarification or thoughts you have about how your the argument the fascinating argument that you're building relates to that idea of is it be, it is the movement it itself that is freedom despite what any other outside source would say is the correct movement. Yeah, I think that's a that's a splendid question. You know all good questions are in fact or ought questions, so they're all, in a way, both pragmatic and ethical at the same time, uh, <coughs> because they're speculative. So, you know, if you ask me, um, well, I'm very interested, I'm sorry, you made me think of things I haven't thought about before. <laughs> if you ask me, should, if I knew that there was a, um, a, 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 a line of belief Should I advise my sister to go out and kill Floyd? Um, I would say no. Of course, that would depend, as you know, on how many sisters and others were in that boat. Mm -hmm. you know, breaking that social barrier of segregation. And the numbers there are very important because, you know, uh, 70,000 people marching and breaking a barrier, then of course the police can't kill 70,000 people, but of course you have Tiananmen Square, et cetera. So I think to some extent that is a pragmatic, political, strategic uh, decision that you make. But you see, the interesting thing is that in many of those instances, you can't just make it a force. The, the, the impetus to be the agency of movement depends on political skill of judgment, but it also depends on making that as it's happening, which is why I'm stressing in my work now the temporality of the now, you know, the temporality of the now, not simply saying, you know, if we went back to the, um, uh, the, the history of the mov women's movement in 1876 or 1954, and they went out to Hyde Park and et cetera, et cetera, so we shouldn't do it, no. You have to make that decision in media square. And that's why the work is difficult to write because I'm always trying to deal with that temporality of the transition, the temporality of now, how to shape it, how to hold it in words or indeed in act. But you know, there is another thought here. And again, I think it does depend on numbers. And it also to some great degree depends on the inherent confidence that, peop that the power that the power blocks have in what they're doing. Now think about it, whether it's in South Africa, Mandela, or Gandhi, who Mandela always saw as his, uh, as his great inspiration, those who prescribe nonviolence do it knowing that the efficacy of their act of nonviolence will be only proven if there is a presumption of violence on the other side. Now, I'm not suggesting that heroism is the only way to go. This is not about heroism. Gandhi, for instance, I know less about Mandela, very practically calculated people. Because he knew that if the, um, his, his followers carried guns, there would immediately be a reason to shoot them down. So I think that it's a, it's, it's that when Arendt talks about movement, I think she's not only talking about program and strategy. That's why I called it an ontological issue. She's talking about freedom 
as the ontology, as the construction of the being in time, to quote our friend who was a fascist, Heidegger, but still is a very important thinker. <laughs> you know, there's no, maybe he's not our friend, he's our friend and enemy, but he's still our, <laughs> we learn a great deal from Heidegger. But how in time, so the idea of the idea of movement and there are implications to it. So the idea of freedom is iterative; it's not repetitive. When that's why I bring what your colleague, what your countryman Adam Michnik said. Mm -hmm. Of course, I take it somewhere very different from where he uh, took it. He wanted to talk about the endangerment of the Ukrainian people. We will, we, uh, Ukrainian freedom is not yet lost. I'm saying that that not yet lostness, you know. That notion of freedom has always been iterative and constitutive, but it's not the same thing. And I think one of the problems about uh, theories of universalism, whether they underlie the concept of rights, whether they underlie the concept of civil liberty, the problem with universalism is thoughts like freedom, justice, etc., are seen as normative ideas. And if you fail, then you fail the norm. That's why I first of all <coughs> talked about negative politics. We learn more from the struggle against injustice than we learn from the normativity of justice. Now, having so, so what, what does that say? That says that the whole sense of process is in the way, it's not just a practice or a program. Process, ontologically, affectively, emotionally, ethically, aesthetically, Process is as important, is even more important, the ethics of process, mm -hmm. than outcomes and products. Mm. And here, if I might just say, this is one of the reasons why I think the humanities is so important. I always argue, you know, every line we read, every word we interpret, we always see as in process in relation to what follows it, what came before it. Interpretation is an ethical practice, and it is also a political practice, for it's that particular halting, repetitive, iterative temporality. Mm -hmm. We don't do experiments uh, on animals and then say, you know, it's terrible that we use these animals for these experiments. The outcome is such that we won't do it again. We have no option of saying never again. If we are responsible humanists, we have to do it as word, as we interpret, philologists, genealogists, word by word, line by line. And, and the best of us, oh, I don't count myself, the best of you do exactly <laughs> that. And I think that's also why she says, you know, it's not the principle. You can keep iterating the principle, but the movement of the, of the thought. In fact, there's a very famous line somewhere else and as I'm trying to finish this book, I have to pull all these things like straws in my head. That's why I always have a pen when I lecture, so something strikes me and I... Mm -hmm. and I <laughs> but, you know, there she says, when you think the very thought of freedom assumes movement. Mm -hmm. If you... The, sorry, 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 I've got this wrong. The very nature of thinking of thought assumes movement. The very nature of thinking, because if you don't assume that, then you're enslaved in hegemony or, hetero het or orthodox. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does that answer your question? It does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have another question. Um, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Does it work? All right. So first of all, uh, poor people need to leave. So should we just let them leave? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You see, there's a freedom of movement. <laughs> There is. Okay, we've had enough. Now we need to At go. the present moment. Well, I'm so glad I gave this invitation for people to leave. <laughs> they were, their freedom, their right to freedom was clearly being restricted. I'm going to use it. <laughs>
Okay, can we? All right. Yes, please. Um, so actually, this was uh, uh, the last part of my comment slash question. So first of all, thank you so much. Sorry, where are you? I can't see you. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, you yes. are. Yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Anja Pochmara, and um, um, I, I work here at the Institute of English Studies with uh, Anja. Uh, all right. So first of all, thank you again. It was a great lecture. We had. You know, our expectations were very high, so, and I'm sure that we are <laughs> all very thrilled, and our students as well. We teach uh, your texts in, even in the first year. So, right, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the second thank you is more precise. Uh, so, I'm very grateful for this uh, very elegant distinction between systematic racism and traumatic racism. And it definitely helps us m make uh, the humanities significant and meaningful. Um, so, when I uh, teach African American literature, and I tell my students that, well, at the turn of the 20th century, we witnessed about 150 lynchings uh, a year. Uh, they somehow, it doesn't make as much an impression on them, like the, the statistic. And then we read uh, the literature and it's, it's way more meaningful and they are uh, able to understand way better why uh, Richard Wright, for example, tells uh, that he uh, has never been abused by white people, but he feels as if he uh, has been the victim of, the thousand, of a thousand uh, lynchings. So thank you so much. It, it really uh, is very helpful. Let me just add to that. That is very much at the heart of what I'm writing now. And I'm writing, making the same kind of distinction in the work I'm writing on the refugees uh, and, and migration as in this. That's, these are the two um, sections that I'm actually working on and then the book can go. And my wife, Professor Baba, who's sitting here, will be very relieved <laughs> <laughs> that, she, that, that she doesn't have uh, a husband who always says tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. I, uh, I can perfectly understand that. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, my question would be how to make this politics of unpreparedness, this politics that is anxious and negative, effective in quantitative terms? In so what do you mean not to make only it effective for in quantitative uh, terms? Right, so terms. not only uh, so that it is not only the politics of the minorities. Is it possible? Oh, I, th I, th I think um, so. There, there are two things here. One, you <coughs> know, in a, in a in a talk like this, I can only do so much, and maybe I can only do it elaborate this. But I have begun <coughs> to see what I talked about as the the notion of the unprepared, uh, all the implications of unpreparedness that happen in the uh, stop and frisk, you know. I, it certainly, I, I found it recently in, uh, um, in, in, in the law uh, uh, emerging, the sort of thing I'm talking about, which I'm trying to formulate, in a lot of the work on what is called qualified immunity. <laughs> These are the regulations, conventions, I don't know the exact legal word, but when you have this kind of a moment that I described, somebody goes out to buy a bottle of milk or somebody goes with a false $20 note to buy a cigarette and then they come out and, you know, uh, t t f 20, eight minutes, uh, after eight minutes of a struggle, they're dead. And this has happened again and again. I'm just giving you this, uh, this sort of example. So when, when you have that kind of uh, 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 process, um, you begin to see um, not in, in, in quantitative terms, I think when you talk in quantitative terms, you lose me. Because I think in quantitative terms, you might say uh, this was death number 2001 in this part of... Um, Minneapolis, uh, 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 and where the the local police have have been condemned so many, or, uh, or uh, you know where there have been so many of these things, you, you have so many of these attacks. You you make it quantitative uh, in in that way, but the 
But the question is mm -hmm. that, and I try not to be circular here, but I think that if you took the quantitative view, you would not understand, and there is a lot still to be understood, why an unknown person, George Floyd, in and out of prison, buying a cigarette at the corner of 39th and Chicago in Minneapolis, this is not the Champs Elysees, you know, it's, uh, uh, why that would suddenly spark such a movement. I think you can't think about that without thinking about the, uh, how that moment, and in fact, in this paper, I didn't read it, I said, you know, if you take the video, which is how most people heard about this event, and there are many <coughs> other such, Rodney King was an earlier moment. So uh, this is a fairly s complex argument, which I'm developing. I only thought about it very recently. That when you look at that, um, uh, and I'll come back to the qualified immunity issue uh, as a policy matter. When you look at that I I video, the content is very clear what is happening. There's brutality, there's police brutality, there's the witnesses saying, please stop doing this, you know, you're the man can hardly breathe, there's an there's a, there's a emergency, emergency fire person there, woman saying, I know I deal with this, to address his neck pulse, etc., etc. That's the content you get. But the beauty of this, what I call teletrauma, is that when you see the video again, the <coughs> event happened 25th of May 2020, but the 8.57 minutes that I'm looking are the 8.57 minutes being taken, being occupied of my time now in Warsaw on the 7th. You see what I have the distinction? Mm -hmm. So one is more rational, the, the content is be, will be used in policy issues about policing, they will be used in court issues, etc. What happened? What did he do? But the 8.57 minutes, which by the way, is that is became the iconic uh, symbol of, or s of this whole thing. People sang for 8.57 minutes, they danced in the arts, I'm saying they danced, they, they drew murals of that. So the process, the movement of time, which we tend to think in a lot of, I ask my legal colleagues, I say, what is the most important element when you think about racism in the police? And they said, by far the co notion of place. Where the person was walking, I think somebody here, you know, walking in an area they were not supposed to walk in, walking late at night, a uh, black person in a white area, uh, da, da 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 da, place. And I said, what about time? Because to me, the time is as important, these moments that I'm picking up of traumatic <coughs> racism, it, that it's that in the middle of the time that there is a struggle, there is a miscomprehension. D Floyd is desperately saying in that short period of time, look, I'm giving you my symptoms. I am claustrophobic and I have anxiety symptoms. Why are you so frightened? What are we doing? Answer our questions. The, disc the voice of the law. He says, I can't answer this question at the moment because I'm, and he's literally shaking. And they say, why is he squirreling? Is he only uh, pretending to be? The guy's you know, completely cr crushed with anxiety. Now, how can this be made quantitative? I don't know. But quali qualified immunity as a legal instrument is applies in exactly these moments. And the position of the Supreme Court has been to eliminate, as far as possible, all the things I've been talking about and relating to an individual, you know, a, a, an ontology of freedom as movement. So basically, the Supreme Court has said, time and time again, in these moments where policemen are caught in these traumatic, they don't use the word trauma, but in these very quick moments, they talk <coughs> about time. Huh? In these moments, we trust the trained police and we take the perspective of the, of the police who've had training, who've had education, there is the culture in that, whatever the police precinct is. And so they, that's why one of our colleagues at Harvard said, that the Supreme Court has more or less said, don't ever send such cases to us. 
we really want to, we will not, um, uh, 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 we will take the position of the police roughly. And it, it just refuses any other kind of um, way of thinking ab uh, 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 about these issues, which is why uh, uh, Sotomayor has consistently argued against it. And the terms of which she's argued against it are the terms I'm talking about. The slow stripping of the dignity of the individual, the putting that individual in such a place of vulnerability that the only thing they would think, oh my God, I mean, am I going to be shot or am I not going to be shot? Shall I run? Shall I not run? And as soon as they run, that is an excuse for shooting them in the back or in the front. So I can't tell you, I can give you this particular legislation, which I'm actually also writing about, um, where whatever the rules of the game are, there is, a, there is an acknowledged high level of temporal anxiety. But the law does not have a way of dealing with anxiety. They will have a way of saying, was undue force used? And of course, as you know, Chauvin was put into prison, second degree murder, and they have all these categories. Undue force was used, um, he, 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 this was not the way he was trained, etc. These are the more quantifiable categories. But I'm saying it is the other part of the narrative that has cr created a situation where in that time, places, and I forget the name of the place in Texas, where there was a 1.001 black presence, even that small town had a huge, uh, not a huge, they had a small comparatively, but had a Black Lives Matter um, uh, a move, uh, 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 protests. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a simplification to think that the best political arguments are made on the basis of these uh, pre-given uh, regulations or laws. I think that's not the only way to deal with the reality which we live. I think it is not the way, because I think that the what elicits our best uh, attempts to lean into risk are not those moments. It is not to say, this is, this, you know, when the governor comes up, this is terribly unjust. This is not the America I know. You basically want to say, shut up. This is the America. Don't repeat that. Repeat what I said. Yes, yes. Go back and say, yes, that's true. It's, yes. And this is the country and it's what I think is the most difficult mm -hmm. to live in. I think that there is no such Let me add this. That, you know, I started reading a which I'm not even competent, but I only read about things I don't know about. So I, this is about this movement called Statistical Lives, which is the basis on which a lot of thinking in uh, on economics and law, that particular blend of economics and law goes. These are all these speculations, you know, if you had uh, $100,000 in your hand and you were going to these thought experiments and you, that $100,000, had been reserved to improve the safety net in mines, and then six miners were caught in that, and you know, before you put that uh, mechanism in place, and six miners are dying, and then they say, you know, to rescue them, we need that $100,000. Should you give that $100,000 to save six lives, or should you, based on statistical reason, keep it to re uh, to, to, to rehabilitate the whole system. So statistical lives is, it has given me an insight into what happens, not that I'm saying data shouldn't be collected, it should be collected, but it can't be the only arbiter of moral ethics and values. And often that is where policy goes. Um, and what is there, and so in reading that area, what was their major, uh, of all these, great specialists on, on statistical lives, what is the thing they most wanted to oppose? They most wanted to oppose what they called the vividness of an encounter. Their word is theirs, they're not mine. This is the word that is used by, uh, by lawyers and, and by economists. Because they said vividness appeals to emotion, to imagination, and you cannot run a country like that. I think what we are proving increasingly
is that when people take the risk, as they did for George Floyd in a pandemic, lockdown was just opening up, and very few people acted irresponsibly. Most of them were masked, not all. But the statistics are very low of people who got, in those, who got infected through that process. So that's why I'm saying um, um, we, we in the humanities need to <coughs> raise a charge based on the things we know. And this is my attempt in trying to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you very much. We have a question here. Just a little. But now we are chasing everybody out no, of the room. No, no, please <laughs> don't go. Stay. Just a little yeah. question. Actually, sure. two. One, I was wondering, uh, and of course, this is for us to figure out. When you were quoting Michnik, I had a sense that he was actually referring to one verse of the Polish nat national anthem, and he was playing with yes, this. Right. So I was thinking, that's you know, right. because uh, you are also to me a godfather of cosmopolitan, new cosmopolitan studies. So I was thinking about that movement also, you know, like that pendulum swinging, you yes. know, from and, you know, um, and also because we, you were referring to Hannah Arendt, and Hannah Arendt, actually, she constructed her philosophy on that idea that thought itself is the best manifestation of action, yes, yeah? so it's, she was against that rigidity, yes, yes like when she was watching Eichmann, for example, but I was thinking that there are moments, you know, and th those are traumatic moments, this is the, those, you know, with the time is, you know, the temporality changes, and this is, for example, for us at the time when Russia invaded Ukraine, yes, that, that is that yes. moment. Now, I'm thinking that these are the moments when, you know, that, uh, you know, kind of fluidity of thought, you know, that it's suspended as well. And actually, these are the moments when the thought becomes rigid all of a sudden. And I was thinking, for example, about Zelensky, you know, who constructed his career on this fluidity of a, you know, of a thought as a comedian, yes? And then he became the president, his country is invaded, and all of a sudden, he's transformed, you know, he's rigid, you know, he's, you know, uh, it's, it's a very different thought style. And I was thinking, how would you address this? That there are certain moments when, you know, that philosophy, I would, I would say that action, it's something different, that it's like, a, again, a pendulum, depending on the time that we swing from those moments that are rigid moments, when we don't move, you know, when we are very rigid, when we know what is right, what is wrong, and then we swing back to that kind of, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, freedom in becoming thought in becoming, we speculate, we invite dialogues, we have a conversation. Thank you. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent uh, uh, question again. But let me just say this, that, um, that war, war uh, is a very special issue. I mean, if, you pe you know, if, there, if people come into your home, burglars come into your home, or, or, uh, 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 or, or the Russian uh, you know, tanks enter your city, of course, you can't say, no, no, this is the right to movement, please move on. <laughs> you know, come and rob me, come and take my country. No, so I think, uh, I think what we are talking about are conditions of danger when democratic institutions and instruments play. If, you, if I point a gun at you and, you know, and I want to shoot you, then your agency is immediately problematic. Of course, you may have a very clever... Uh, uh, tell you know you may be like uh, 101 Arabian Nights. You might say, well, put your gun away. Uh, let me tell you a story, and then the next time I raise my gun, say, put your gun away. Let me tell you another story. <laughs> so, uh, and and it's not as if that also sometimes doesn't happen. You know, it does happen, but it's very rare. So I think that what I, that what I am talking about <coughs> uh, necessarily is not about the mobilization of war. I'm not talking about the mobilizing violence as war. I'm talking about the violence on the streets. I'm talking about uh, racial, um, you know, over time racial attacks. So uh, I do, and I also, but having said that, I also feel that if the rigidity, and this is something that I don't know enough, if the, if the, the rigidity to fight the enemy in a situation of war may allow the pendulum between thought and action to swing s smaller, you know. But that rigi rigidity in time can turn back into the nation itself. 
And that, you know, and that may not be at the moment of war, but it may be at the post-war moment. That's the rigidity that we cannot allow to forget what you picturesquely called a pendulum because we will need, we have to need it again. That's why Fanon says, in the midst of the struggle against uh, European colonialism, he says two very important things. Unless we know what internationalism is, and there he's in a war, kind of warlike situation, we will never be able to construct a third world nationalism. And that's why for him, it's not about nation and territory, it's about region, it's about ethics, it's about equality, it's about psychoanalysis, it's about freedom, it's about all sorts of things. Not that he wasn't involved in also justifying Algerian attacks on other, FLN attacks on other Algerians, etc. He was. That's why I'm saying the pendulum is there still. However, at particular moments, the swing is less. Um, and I think that's the important thing to imagine. The problem is those who do not think of that movement and who only see polarization. So you have a polarized binary view of political negotiation or interaction. Do you see what I'm saying? Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that you saw that. Okay, we have one more question. One more question. <laughs> one more question. Here we go. <laughs> I'll try to make it a, as short as possible, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm very happy to be a member of this audience, thank you. Uh, my question, um, I'm particularly interested in how you read the narratives of traumatic racism. Because from what I gather, you collect these narratives, these stories, you collate them together. And so my question would be, how do you work with these texts, with these stories? How do you braid them into your own writing? Thank you. Well, I mean, I mean, I could just read another 10 pages of the paper that I didn't read if you really wanted me to do that, which you don't. Um, well, I read them, uh, and this is a very general question about my own method. First of all, um, if you know my work controversially, I often, um, uh, I often use philosophical or literary poetic ideas or art or whatever but I don't tend to explain my theory in relation to the art. I tend to pull them together. I allow the art or the poet or the philosophical idea, as I did with Arendt. Mm -hmm. I brought the Arendt in when I'd already set up the notion of the unprepared, when I had already explored around the unprepared the idea of freedom as this kind of, to use your word, this pendulum aspect I'd already brought in the idea of the conditional, not yet, you know, and freedom is not yet, which is your right to say is often in the, in the, in the national anthem and so on. So I tend to, to not to bring the stories in or the anecdotes in uh, simply to illustrate a point I've made. I try to use what I see as the theoretical and rhetorical um, um, uh, uh, weight of the anecdote and make it part of both the conceptual as well as the poetic uh, grace. That's why I tend to write like a bad poet, you know. <laughs> I, I tend to write, I, I always listen to the concept. I don't, I'm not like many other uh, or other theorists for whom making the argument and concluding the argument is imp imp only important. So as I say, you know, as now, now, would you have put Baldwin and, and Arendt together around a certain problem? So I'm always inventing my own constellations. And I'm not, uh, if you want a kind, that's why I never teach a theory of literature course that goes from ba da 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 da. I just don't do it because I, you know, it, it's not what I do. I, rather create kernels of problems and then bring the intensity of various thoughts around them, whether they resolve, they don't resolve, I don't mind that at all. Um, I, I always tell my students the important thing for me is not some elegant clarity. The important <coughs> thought for me is the struggle of trying to do something which you want to do and may be difficult to do. <laughs> 
Now, Justice Baldwin and Arendt, I brought it, you know, you saw the way I worked those two together. Now, of course, Arendt and Fanon um, uh, were quite at loggerheads. Well, poor, not poor Fanon, he was dead but uh, by then. But Arendt wrote, you know, very critically of Fanon that he's the kind of avenging angel of violence, etc. Well, as I showed, you know, I was able to deal with the, the notion of movement, and then I was able to take that into the Baldwin, uh, sorry, into the Fanon, where Fanon says, you know, to talk about the pendulum, you know, uh, every generation has to make its decisions or find its values, its commitments, in relative obscurity. It's almost like, like negative politics. It's like saying you start with, not with the norm, but you start with the process. You start with the project. Project like the French use, projeté, you know, both to, you have a project, but it's also a risk in the future. So that's the way, you, uh, sorry, have I given you a sense of how I work? <laughs> yes, 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 although I was also interested in the selection of the anecdotes themselves. They're not anecdotes mostly. Anec they're mostly, they're citations. I mean, so there are times when I deal with anecdotes, but I don't have a principle of uh, m my search for, I mean, I don't do anecdotage, as, as Freud once put it, you know. Uh, he said, as we grow older, we all have this habit of anecdotage. Uh, we're telling stories uh, because we're old and we're losing our, the sharpness. I don't do anecdotage. Um, it, 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 I, and if I use an example of something, it's not done to emphasize the personal over the political or the singular over the collective. It's not done from that purpose. So it's much more done by thinking about what psychic mechanisms or affective mechanisms or how a concept is being constructed, even if it's being constructed in a poem or an or, 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 or some uh, uh, anecdote. But it's not about telling this, you know, you say all this politically, now let me give you some examples. It's not that. I don't teach like that also, and I don't think like that. Well, we have already kept Professor <laughs> a bit longer than, than expected. Uh, so um, um, on behalf of uh, the Dean of our faculty and all the members of our faculty and all the guests uh, of our Congress, uh, thank you very much once again. Professor, let us make one big round of applause. I just want to remind you